like many of you, I've experienced the worst era in our society. I've experienced the brutality of our South African police force and had the privilege of the hospitality in solitary confinement for a couple of months. And of course, experienced the obligatory torture that comes with it. But at the same time, I had the privilege, like many of you, to see Nelson Mandela get out of Baltimore prison, to experience the joy and hope of a nation that gave us so much confidence that we're going to reverse this negative effects of our body and improve the lives of our people. But unfortunately, we are confronted with the situation today that we are falling far short. Poor leadership, corruption, lack of vision are the various things that's impacting us. But personally, after all these experiences and the journeys I've gone through, I come here today as an eye care activist, not as a politician. <clears throat> and it's a choice that a lot of my friends, comrades and colleagues, actually sometimes mock and cannot fathom why I've made the choice. Why I can't be asked. Why not politics or the broader development agenda? I've chosen the route of IK and social enterprise because social entrepreneurship is a powerful vehicle. And today my intention is to talk about, through talking through what we do in our organization, to give you a sense of why that is so. There are 625 million people in our world who are blind or visually impaired simply because they cannot afford or get access to the simple thing. Spectacle or eyeglasses is something to refer to. There's close to 2.5 billion people in the world who need access but cannot get that as well. <coughs> But when we look at the issues that are discussed, even in the previous session, when you talk about HIV, malaria, tuberculosis, getting access to the simple, almost insignificant thing, is it a real a development agenda? Well, imagine a child who leaves home and despite all the barriers of poverty, is able to get to school on an empty stomach, maybe traveling two, more than two kilometers or walking more than two kilometers to get there, but when eventually getting there, unable to see the board and again finds another barrier in this continuum of poverty. Education helps break intergenerational poverty and vision is an enabler in that process. The mother who struggles and does sewing and mending to bring in money to feed, clothe, or educate her children is in her late 30s, early 40s, and as some of you know, her hands are not getting any longer, so she can't, they can't read, and needs a simple pair of reading glasses. Now you will say, well, it's a reading glass, it's just go to a pharmacy and get it, or get it get clicks. But the reality is, for 517 million people in, in our world, they live blind and visually impaired at near simply because they cannot get access to a pair of freedom glasses. That is the reality of many people. Then you have this gentleman from Mozambique who was able to get access to cataract surgery, a really complicated process compared to providing an eye exam and a pair of glasses. <coughs> But if he didn't make his own pair of glasses, we'll still be walking around blind after cataract surgery. That is the reality that many people face. In the Brian Olden Vision Institute, we conducted a study, and we've shown that in the year 2010, there were one billion people in the world who were short-sighted or had myopia. 
and that by the year 2050, given the current trends and the projections, by the year 2050, it'll be five billion. And you know what's frightening about that? In 2050, it would be 50% of the world's population. We are heading towards a public health crisis. But of course, many governments, due to inaction or unwillingness, have not done much. The private sector, in particular, looks for the short-term returns and doesn't want to focus on the issues that will prevent us. So, for example, we learn that if children spend more time outdoors, it actually prevents the onset of myopia or short-term Simple intervention. But in our materialistic world, we are pushing our children to study more than they should. We are forcing them to become competitive animals, and they spend all their time indoors. And if they're not studying, what are they doing? They're playing with their mobile phones. Okay? The world has shifted from me outdoors to indoors. And unless we focus on health promotion, which again is a long-term view to intervention, if we start, don't start changing the way that children are brought up, we're going to end up with a major public health crisis. And not just in the developing world, in both the developing and developed world, which shows that we have a truly global public health crisis that we are heading for. What is even worrying is that 10, 20% of this group would have what we call high myopia because of the stretching of the globe. So it's a very high short-sightedness. And that 20% or billion people in 2050 will be at increased risk of blindness and visual impairment and going to put enormous economic burden on healthcare systems, which most governments are not showing the willingness to invest in. As a result, we are heading towards an economic crisis in healthcare. But interesting, but if all of this doesn't catch, how can we look at, let's look at the economic figures. We published a study in the World Health Organization Bulletin where we showed that it cost the world $202 billion per annum in lost productivity because people have, uh, have uncorrected refractive error, which is far-sightedness and short-sightedness. But we also published a paper where we showed that it cost $39 billion to set the infrastructure to address this issue. But again, there's a lack of willingness to focus on sustainable programs. And as a result, little as well. I had the privilege of meeting a gentleman in 1997 by the name of Professor Brian Alden, who's late enough. He was a world leading contact lens researcher. And he had come to a realization that all the research and the academic accolades of the world don't translate into something that really impacts on people's lives. As a result, he was getting interested in public health. At that time, I'd returned from the US after being a student there and was trying to start an NGO and some programs in Dublin. And he said, well, we should work together. Let's try and do something together. He registered an NGO in Australia. And then thereafter, I registered the International Center for IK Education in Africa. But we did one other thing. We realized that depending on, don depending on donor funds is a problem. So we brought all the research team that uh, support that Professor Holden was involved in in contact lenses together with the public health work and created a global eye care social enterprise, which we eventually named the Brian Holden Vision Institute. Through that, we have been able to commercialize our research and products to the value of $26 billion have been sold in the world, generating royalties for us and our partners of greater than $300 million. Now, people get excited about the numbers. They say, what a great thing. That's not why I'm, I'm mentioning that. What that gave us is the independence and freedom from donor-driven agendas. Because we in the development sector are constantly forced to do things that others want to do. And a lot of times don't do what our people want us to do. <coughs> because we need to sustain our organizations, etc., And that's what, beside all the other comments made, that makes social enterprise such a powerful strategy in this broader space that we are working in. So we do translational research, develop cutting-edge products. We reinvest a lot of that money in 
into research, but into public health to create sustainable eye care services. We also develop affordable technology that supports sustainable eye care services. So how does this translate? So for example, training people over four to six years to learn how to do eye exams, provide services, is not a sexy agenda. Like doing a fancy eye camp with great television coverage. Or doing a development program and driving trucks with a lot of food to feed people. It's not a sexy. However, it allowed us to set up schools of optometry, to develop optometrists in countries like Malawi, Uganda, Mozambique, Vietnam, and other parts of the world, so that the local graduates can develop and who can sustainably then provide services. And most importantly, our role is catalytic. It is not for us to entrench ourselves. And we hope that these graduates will eventually make us obsolete and will say to all NGOs and social enterprises, we don't need you in our country. Sustainable services becomes possible if we generate the income that we have control over. We have set up vision centers in collaboration with governments <coughs> across the world. We work in about 54 countries. And through these vision centers, made IK accessible to thousands. But anybody could do that. But one of the things that we made as a prerequisite when we collaborate with government, they have to invest and they have to commit to taking over that project after X number of years. Because it's not the role of civil society to replace the responsibility at a national level. It is our role to demand that those people who get elected to serve our people actually deliver for our people. But with all the work of the development sector, the work of the government, we still realize there's a big gap. So we again look to social enterprise strategies. We set up a social franchise model, and we're now supporting optometrists, ophthalmologists, and other eye care practitioners to set up practices in Africa, in communities where conventional businesses will not want to invest because the return on investment is not good enough. But our return on investment is calculated differently. And through that, we are able to not only empower local people, but increase services. In Pakistan, women health workers are able to provide eye care services, reading glasses, for example, generate income for themselves. And our partner is a women's group, who then uses the profits to subsidize other activities that they're involved in, like, for example, empowering women. So there's a possibility of social enterprises interfacing across sectors, which is critical if we really want to make a big difference. But we were also confronted with the enormous cost of products in the world, the middleman phenomenon, where the cost of everything is driven through the roof. And sometimes I look at all you guys with spectacles and I laugh because if you only knew how much they really cost. Um, um, but the fact is, that we have to create a supply chain that allows us to be able to meet needs of people in a sustainable way. So we set up a global resource center, and let me point out African-based. And these are things I was often told cannot work in Africa. That is now supplying frames, lenses, and other products to IK programs across the world and cutting out the middleman and allowing organizations to create sustainable service delivery and also income generation so that local communities can actually build their own capacity. But I was visiting one of our projects in, in Tanzania. It was great to see the work that we were doing with children, but I left depressed. And the question I kept asking, why do we have an island of success in a sea of despair? How can we duplicate this? We know in the development sector that a lot of us tend to compete with each other for limited funds because the donors drive the agenda. The reality is that if we cannot come up with strategies to upscale our efforts, it calls to question what we do. We're creating nice products, nice programs, 
for us to advertise and talk about ourselves. So we launched a campaign called Our Children Vision to reach 50 million children by the year 2020. Using a philosophy of partner or perish, which actually I think should apply to social enterprises and the development sector in broadly. Using a philosophy of partner or perish, we've drawn 51 organizations together to reach this target. And through this effort, we hope to reach 50 million children. It has its benefits. It's attracted the attention of Bono from YouTube, who together with the Sunrise company Revo has put significant millions of dollars into the adult and child IR program. Because as social activists, he recognized the value of sustainable service delivery. So there are people out there who want to invest with us in a different way. So having gone through all of that and spoken about it, let me go back to answering the questions of my friends and colleagues. And sometimes my brother says, he brings CVs to me, you should apply for this job. Um, um, because he, he thinks it, it's I care, like, you know. Uh, but the reality is that through I care, we create access to education for children and enable their success. Through I care, we are able to ensure that adults stay in jobs or are not prevented from getting jobs by one more hurdle in the continuum of poverty. Through I care, we can ensure that the elderly have a good quality of life at a time when they should really deserve it. We need to ensure through I care, I am able to implement sustainable development projects that interfaces with the broader development agenda. So, our people don't need charity, they need empowerment. And through the efforts, the programs we've been involved in, I feel that we are now able to be catalytic and create a model that makes civil society organizations obsolete when they are the funders of the program. So to my friends and to my brother too, it's a damn good development agenda. Thank you. <laughs>